University of Cambridge, from uh, the European Climate Foundation, the Brazilian Bar, uh, Rio del Grande chapter, uh, Deloitte, um, including the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, the Harvard Kennedy School of Women's Network, the Organization of Women in International Trade, based in Brussels, and World Foundation. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will have very short presentation, so we are asking our speakers to really just share one central thought on the topic. And we have world-class speakers that uh, my world-class colleague, um, Alessandra Lemon, is going to introduce. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alessandra Lehmann. Uh, it is an immense pleasure for me personally and for the Brazilian Bar of Rio Grande do Sul State Chapter to join Professor Gehring today in co-chairing this extremely timely discussion on the intersection of climate law and trade law. Uh, needless to say, CLGD has established itself as the largest legal event at COPS, uh, featuring uh, the most cutting edge climate law and policy discussions and an always stellar lineup of, of panelists. And for this, I wanted to commend the fantastic work of the team that, it's, that is at the helm of this fantastic event, especially professors Marie-Claire Cordonier Seger and Professor Marcus Gehring. Uh, so uh, I mentioned this is a timely session and there are a couple of reasons for this. So just, for, just to give you a bit of context, climate change uh, has become a key element uh, of trade negotiations on the one hand. And we have also be, been witnessing a very significant rise um, in unilateral climate change measures uh, with cross-border effects on global value chains. Uh, most of them, of course, stemming from the European Union. So we have recent developments with a more direct impact on trade, such as um, the uh, anti-deforestation directive, the due diligence, greenwashing directives, of course, the CBAM. Uh, also, other developments that also impact uh, global uh, value chain uh, in different manners, such as those directives regarding uh, sustainable taxonomies, antitrust, and uh, environmental crime, for instance. Uh, and besides those developments, we have been witnessing a rise of sustainability and climate reporting standards, both mandatory, such as the CSRD and CSRD, and ESRS, all of them stemming again from the European Union, and voluntary such as the ISSB, S1, and S2 that are also affecting actors uh, along global value chains. Uh, so it is absolutely vital that we as legal scholars and practitioners delve deeply into these implications. So this is uh, pretty much what makes today's session uh, particularly relevant. Uh, as Marcus said, uh, we are lucky uh, to have an absolutely fantastic panel today uh, to address these fundamental topics. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Mario Stokas, Program Manager of Trade, Trade and Investment at the CISDL. Uh, Myra Souza, Program Lead at the Harvard Kennedy School Women's Network. Uh, professor Dr. Uh, Emilio Lebre La Hoveri, uh, prof full professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and a recipient of the Nobel Prize for his work with the IPCC. Uh, Resh Masharma, director for uh, Deloitte Middle East. Uh, professor Javier Caceres uh, from the International uh, Institute of International Studies at the University of Chile. Dr. Uh, Fabiano de Andrade Correa, co-chair of the IUCN WCL uh, Climate Change Law Specialist Group. Uh, uh, professor Richard Beardsworth, international relations professor and head of school, co-chair of the University of Leeds UNFCCC Task Force. Ms. Jennifer Morricone, founder of OWIC Brussels. Professor Geraldo Vidigal, assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam. Professor Ilaria Espa, Associate Professor at USI Lugano, and last but certainly not least, uh, Ricardo Melendez, founder of Ceruleum uh, Global Sustainability.
one very pretty tool is introduced to the opposite of climate change is facts and Station and other explicit measures unilateral or similarly in bilateral uh, free trade agreements in FTAs where we have commitments with regards to effective implementation of environmental agreements, effective implementation of the NDCs. What I want to point out is that we need to look at trade policy and climate change more integrated into, into uh, trade policy to look into non explicit environmental chapters and environmental regulations. When you look, for example, at trade concessions, tariff concessions in a free trade agreement, you have to look to what extent you grant the tariff free access to uh, carbon intensive products, and to what extent you may have a, diff a different and more difficult access to, uh, to less carbon intense products. So a big discussion and we saw recently in the EU, New Zealand, and the UK, New Zealand, where we have the first big uh, uh, green goods and green services uh, commitments that seek to promote easier access to green goods and green services. This is a way to make trade be greener without having to, full, to introduce com formal commitments on non-regression. Rather, we leave the market, we leave the trade to move on along the gre greener path. And there, it's important to integrate climate change in this discussion because, for instance, a large part, so I'm, I'm based in Switzerland, in Geneva. A large discussion a few years back was the EFTA Indonesia Free Trade Agreement. And a large discussion there was whether to introduce uh, tariff free access to palm oil. And there was a whole referendum in Switzerland with regards to sustainable palm oil. So after the referendum passed, they agreed to move on with the agreement and they added in the tariff concessions free, uh, the zero duties on sustainable palm oil. The thing is that if you look behind the lines, the non-sustainable palm oil, which 90% uh, of it is used for animal feed, uh, is almost to 2 or 3% tariff. So if you look how this will be implemented, that means that there is no incentive for a natural producer to be sustainable, because they would either way with 2% more or 3% tariff, uh, uh, export from uh, Indonesia to Switzerland non-sustainable palm oil. So this is where we have, made, uh, we have done research with the CASDL with Marcus here, Alessandra, Javiera, and Laria, uh, we have made proposals on how to make what we call the horizontal chapters, the chapters that do not deal with trade and sustainability, but are purely trade, which are subsidies, uh, trade in goods, trade in services, IP, those need to become greener. So the norm is not that we have a separate, we have trade and trade and environment, but rather climate change and environmental protection is integrated into trade policy. And at the end of the day, these are like the smaller the, the technical details that do matter, which may be a simple tariff, maybe a service concession in favor of green services and green goods. I will leave it at that. So I will give a little more space to the rest. And thank you very much. Mario, you have the floor for the next two or three minutes. First of all, thank you for, for the invite. And uh, although I'm here on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School of Business Network, there is no way I cannot share a view from the private sector to whom I work with in my daily life. Uh, so it starts, of course, I think most of you are aware of the increasing number of climate implications uh, to the WTO, right? And then we all see the proliferation of trade measures that impact the daily operations of the company. So on my professional life, I'm a global responsible for trade advocacy and trade compliance. And then you can imagine that my life is very busy for the past years, and especially the past two years. So when we look into this, first of all, to understand the complexity, of course, we have to hire like a very good attorneys like you, <laughs> that is sometimes very uh, costly, but is also very handful. Um, and to really understand with the, first of all, interpretation, interpret, because this is really interpretation, it is really something that, uh, what it means for the company. But I also bring this, my position in trade, also more into the strategic level. So now if we look into trade, uh, really into ESG being into account, 
I'm having a table in discussions with my sustainability team as well, where trade really became important. Also being a voice, even when we have the sustainability report now as well. Uh, so just to say, highlight once more how trade became important. Um, and then for the cross functional projects that we have, we're like, how are we going to implement that? What is this? And it's really complex. So first of all, even if you talk about different carbon pricing schemes, we have more than 23, uh, 73, I think, different around the world. And then if you have, again, I'm based in Europe, so there is no way that I don't look into Europe and leave examples in Europe. Um, but then we have EU deforestation regulation. The reporting system is one as a company that we need to deal with. And then we have the coming CBAN reporting as of right next year. It's a different system. And then we're dealing now with the German supply chain due diligence. Once again, a reporting, another different system, <laughs> you know, different collection of data. And as a comparison, do we have all the good quality data even to generate all these good assessments? No, to be honest with you. And it's not only one company, it's with all the different trade associations and companies that I deal with. So the complexity is there. Another point is like, I think it's a driving force and is needed. Uh, but we don't see much of the dialogue that is said together with the public sector, right? I think we need to come more to discussions because sometimes when you put at the difficulty of implementation, either they don't wanna hear or they don't understand. Uh, but this conversation is needed. So a more balanced approach where we don't wanna see, for example, de-industrialization because there are so many measures coming into place. No, we want to see collaboration and more harmonization uh, on the different roles. And then just my last point to close, on top of all that, trade facilitation. The primary point of enforcement is customs, right? And if you ask me, are customs authorities prepared? Do they have resource? No. I will stop here. Wonderful, Mara. Thank you. We will now listen from, uh, hear from Reshma. Reshma, please. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Reshma Sharma, director with Deloitte Middle East. I am the climate and sustainability uh, tax leader for the Middle East practice here. And um, from a day to day um, uh, over the years, what I've been doing is I'm an indirect taxation specialist uh, with many years in the UK and then moved here into the region about five years ago. My uh, industry specialism has been oil and gas and therefore um, uh, and the energy uh, sector. So this topic is very close to heart and, and very topical. So uh, in terms of going back to um, a trade law as a means of uh, promoting climate change, um, maybe a little, I know Maria and, and uh, Myra have already talked about uh, trade facilitation and uh, bilateral or, um, you know, customs, various customs and trade law. Maybe if we uh, dive in a little further and, and think about some of the taxation measures that are uh, coming through, particularly in the EU and other parts of the world, maybe not so much in the Middle East just yet, but it is equally impacting Middle East businesses, whether um, they are operating here or uh, their global subsidiaries. For example, if we take CBAM as an example, which is a piece of EU legislation, but that has a very, very direct impact on, a, on businesses globally. If you're importing or businesses, let's say, based in the Middle East are importing uh, or rather exporting goods um, into the EU, um, they are being impacted or they will be impacted by the CBAM levy, which is making uh, carbon intensive products uh, which are produced here like aluminum, whether it's cement, steel, um, with additional levy. Of course, this will all come through in 2026 and reporting has already kicked off. So, you know, that is clearly a piece of uh, regulation, EU regulation, which is impacting us, uh, impacting us here in the region, uh, particularly where um, goods are moving out from here. There are other pieces of uh, tax regulations, and, and the reason I keep referring to, to tax because um, directly it is having an impact on prices and is impacting uh, the level of trades from carbon intensive organizations or carbon intensive operations. Um, and therefore, what we're seeing is um, it is indeed uh, having organizations and businesses um, rethink their supply chain, rethink their operating models, and therefore readjust their GAG um, emissions levels to ensure they are reacting to these um, pieces of legislation 
uh, the way they are intended to. Um, so I think with that, I'll, I'll pause my two minutes and hand it over to you guys. Thank you very much. Um, and while the panel switches chairs, we're handing over to uh, Professor Caceres. If we could uh, have Javiera in the spotlight by the Zoom team. Javiera, you have the floor. There, can you, yeah. Thank so, you, Marcus. Sorry, Javier. So as I said, we have a panel of superstars today. Uh, and to accommodate all of them at our uh, in-person table today, we would ask uh, uh, Professor Lahoveri, uh, Fabiano, and uh, Dr. Richard uh, to take their seats at the table. Uh, Reshma, Marios, and Myra, thank you for your wonderful uh, contributions. We'll get that back to you later uh, for Q&A. Thank you. Javier, you have the floor, sorry. No worries, thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, I think I wanna stop a bit and kind of share some of our findings within the reports that we've been working on in CIDCL, especially uh, to the perception of EU autonomous responses to the climate, and climate emergency, specifically with the work with Latin America, so particularly in, their, the, in the framework of their trade agreements. So, uh, as was as Marius was saying, acknowledging that we might find environmental related provisions in trade agreements between the EU and Latin America economy, I want to focus on the work done specifically at trade committees and renegotiation processes to reflect on how the parties are reacting to the formulation and implementation of new policies to address climate change. Um, I think this is also very related to the issue of implementing this uh, provision. So. Uh, the analysis I conducted with the CISDL on treaties administration committees and trade and sustainable development committees shows that um, the actions initiated by the European Union are of the utmost importance for Latin American economies. For example, we have that when reviewing the joint minutes from trade and sustainable de development committees between the EU and Colombia, Peru and, and Ecuador, it can be highlighted that issues, for example, such as the European Green Deal and carbon border and adjustment mechanism has been subject of interesting discussion within them. So uh, these discussions have been mainly informative, aiming, for example, to increase party knowledge of the program, sharing experiences towards accurate adaptation of their policies, also a lot on cooperation agreements. So in this meeting, Latin American parties have also identified some areas in which they can increase cooperation and how this cooperation would strengthen their capabilities to respond to environment related policies and comply with their climate change objectives too. Because it'll be also very important to not only address climate change within the trade agreements, but also see how um, Latin American economies in particular can comply with, for example, that NDC's contribution in the context of Paris agreements through these agreements too. Um, also, for example, for the analysis of EU and Chile relations, we may also see that the interest in autonomous policies towards climate change is arising not only for the EU's trading partner concerning the EU policies, but also, for example, high attention has gained uh, the Chilean strategy related to lithium and green hydrogen. So these sectors are considered key elements for electromobility and clean energies and Chile is the one of the main suppliers of both. So uh, these are some of the elements that have been included in these renegotiations agreements, but also post-treaty actions um, that I think will be very important to mention as the first uh, key points within this panel. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Caceres. And um, yeah, are you introducing? So thank you, Javier. Uh, uh, we'll now uh, give the floor uh, to Professor Emilio Lebri uh Emilio, uh, the floor is yours for the next two to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, I'll focus my uh, comments on the first question to be addressed by the panel about uh, climate standards with cross-border elements and impacting global value chains. And I think the, both uh, examples already mentioned here, the 
EU CBAN and also the EU directive uh, uh, about uh, deforestation uh, inducing products that's already in, in, into force this year and also with a, a levy uh, schedule for December 24 for the goods that uh, uh, cause deforestation that are imported by the EU. And I think uh, in our scientific analysis, both in IPCC global scenarios and our national emission scenarios in, in developing countries, emerging economies, we uh, always see in principle this kind of move as a global enabler, an incentive for uh, the productive sector to go of, of towards the faster decarbonization. But there are reasons of concern in the way it's implemented right now. First, it's an unilateral move that actually causes a negative reaction in exporters, the Brazilian government, for instance, even with a much more envi environmentally and climate friendly attitude now in the new administration is talking about seizing the WTO about it. So uh, this, of course, underlines trust, and trust is uh, uh, absolutely essential in this climate negotiations, as we've seen uh, since 30 years now. Then there is also the fact that we have to be specific about technologies. Every uh, carbon pricing move uh, has an effect that can be positive if you have the carbonization technological options available. If you don't have, just cause inflation, uh, cost increase, prices, and this will go, uh, uh, will be uh, transmitted to the consumers and cause uh, economic slowdown. It won't serve the climate cause, neither the economic growth. So I think uh, the way to address this, both these concerns is to try to put forward uh, in this trade agreement, for instance, bilateral agreements between the EU and uh, the South American Mercosur trade uh, agreement, um, uh, working groups and commissions that can actually harmonize the standards. There are certification standards also in the exporting countries. And uh, what we need is targets and time tables that if, for instance, we are going to put a chip in the ear of 210 million heads of cattle, of cattle in Brazil. This will have a significant cost increase, an impact in, in, in meat prices all over the world, because Brazil is the largest uh, exporter of, of meat. Now, there are other protocols, intermediate. Uh, until we get there, we need some time, we need uh, some flexibility. For the deforestation driven products, the solution it's not that difficult, it can be done, but again, it, it has to uh, be done together with harmonization of certification in both exporter and important countries. Let's do Thank you so much, uh, Professor Emilio. And uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lahovery. I forgot to mention that Professor Lahovery is an economist and an engineer. So we're lucky uh, to hear from both perspectives from a scientific standpoint. So this is thank you for this really wonderful contribution. Uh, we'll now uh, hear from Dr. Fabiano de Andrade Correa. Fabiano, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying uh, thank you for the organizers for having this panel. I think it's, it's so exciting to see this momentum on trade and climate change at the COP. Uh, for many years now, we've been doing research, Marcus and Mary Claire, others with CISDL, the relationship between trade and climate change and seeing a trade day, a COP, and you know, the WTO uh, Secretary General with so many events yesterday highlighting the potential is, is certainly exciting. But uh, speaking to, to one of the questions, uh, how are climate issues influencing the progress of trade agreement negotiations, uh, especially between the EU and Americas and beyond? So one of the issues I think that has been discussed for many years is how uh, free trade agreements can, in a way, fill uh, the vacuum that more progress or the lack of more progress 
on, on trade liberalization for environmental goods and services and other topics on the climate agenda. Uh, so how, how could more progress be achieved in, in the context of FTAs? And especially in, in the EU uh, Mercosur relationship, we know that this is such a representative agreement. It would not only create the biggest free trade area in the world, but I think it also highlights some of the key contentious issues in this agenda, right? On the one side, deforestation and, and uh, issues related to land, and on the other side, protectionism and industrial goods and so on. So I think it really is, is a battlefield or an example of, of the contentious issues that can have in this, in, this, uh, in this arena. With Alessandra, we wrote in the, in the context of this project, a chapter looking into uh, climate and environmental provisions related uh, in, in the EU FTA and then how those could be uh, increased. And I, I think for me, answering the question, the key issue is how uh, negotiated issues could come into play in, in, in the context of free trade agreements as opposed to unilateral measures trying to influence. That has been clearly, I think, a barrier in the conclusion of the negotiations of this particular FTA. And from latest news, it seems that it will continue to be so. Uh, so I think the trade, uh, the climate change agenda can clearly play a key role and, and the FTAs could be a key, a, a key vehicle to be more ambitious on, on climate issues, but it will really depend on political will uh, on both sides to, to really come up with, uh, with an agreed agenda that is acceptable to everyone. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Fabiano. And, uh... Yes, this is a good point to hand over um, uh, to Professor Richards Bethworth because we've been talking about uh, the legal dimensions, but there's also a strong political dimension, right? So we hear in Brussels, we can't have a quick ratification of EU Mercosur because of the election of Millet uh, in Argentina, who we all know um, is a new generation of climate denying uh, politician. And that, of course, influences the ratification of trade agreements. Who would have thought? Um, I'm uh, Richard, what are your thoughts? Marcus, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. I'm actually going to probably go back to what Professor Emilio was saying. Um, it is clear that there is a push yeah, for climate and trade to come together and the policy tools that seem most important at the moment um, are regulatory and tariff policies. So for example, the World Trade Organization at the moment really wants to res reverse the tariff policies on high intensive carbon products and low emission, low carbon products, which at the moment are three to one to the advantage of uh, carbon intensive products. That clearly has got to be reversed for there to be the diffusion of green technologies uh, at an international and indeed global level. So one can understand very clearly the import of trade policy with regard to getting uh, climate integrated into the trade regime as a whole, which has been spoken about by other speakers here. And I want to go back, uh, forgive me, I think it's Caviera, uh, Professor Caceres, who was saying, I want to go back to the carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM here, because that is politically all about the EU you know, stopping carbon leakage with regards to imports from non-EU countries, but also from European companies that outsource and then bring back the carbon leakage into Europe. And it's to meet the 55% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030, which is in EU climate law. But it's also so that the EU can remain a soft power climate leader yeah, globally yeah, because it is trying to propagate best practices. And here I actually agree with what uh, Professor Emilio was saying. The problem is this. What is actually a regional policy, even if it, the regional policy wants to attain global standards, we're not yet there politically and historically. So there is a risk, as we all know, that these policies, CBAM, could be of damage. There's a risk, yeah? could be of damage to uh, developing countries because it could be against yeah, their priority of development as poverty reduction. 
with regard to growth, even if obviously there's an enormous attempt several years now, a couple of us has been critical here, to make development, sustainable development, to marry it with climate. Now that simply means that CBAM could actually repeat the saw between developed and developing countries that has been going on since 1992, where you know, developed countries take the lead with regard to climate mitigation, yeah, and developed countries, according to their national capacities, follow. And it's because precisely there hasn't been that relationship and it hasn't been implemented yeah, financially, technically, economically, politically, that there is such mistrust still, and hence such mistrust, maybe it's just a perception, but politically it's critical, such mistrust of a tariff policy like the CBAM. And that is what politically needs to be addressed. And to address it, you know, one can't tinker just with trade policy. You know, for example, one really has to show that climate finance can help domestic industrial capacity within developing countries. Because it's not the market that is critical here, it's the goods that go to market. And those goods have to be greener for them to achieve precisely the market the EU you know, wants so much and wants to be a proponent of as a global climate leader. And there needs to be for that international cooperation, which we know, you know so well with regards to the previous COPs, that international cooperation still needs to be brokered so that trust underpins uh, political agreements and therefore global collective action. So for me, listening to everybody, and it's been really interesting, yeah, it's very important to underpin law and trade policy by political nous. Thank you very much. Fascinating, thank you. Thank you. And um, our next two speakers are online um, for a very short uh, intervention. Um, could we have Geraldo? Uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Marcus. Uh, thanks for to the organizers. Thanks to Alessandra. Thanks to, to everyone at CISTL for, for, for making this possible. Uh, I would like to uh, speak. I mean, I, I speak, of course, in the in the when you, you, I'm sure you all know this that the EU Mercosur negotiations don't seem to be uh, going in a good in a good way, and I think these negotiations are are quite central because the way we see uh, trade agreements is that they have uh, been you know there has been the sort of this greening and and maybe bluing you know the inclusion of so sustainability standards in trade agreements but but so far they've been taking place mostly with countries that are either far less 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 powerful than the eu or the us or that essentially are already developed countries such as canada and new zealand now, I, I think the, the big challenge here will be to get the big uh, developing countries to agree to, uh, as a previous speakers just said, uh, sacrifice or, or change the path trajectory of their growth uh, by uh, renouncing uh, the, the use of carbon emissions, right, of their carbon resources often. And, and this is going to be difficult because, of course, uh, there's a cost uh, involved in that. Uh, and the, the the what what I'm interested in in terms of how the trajectory of of trade agreements uh, can go is the ability of especially developed countries to uh, create the, this this uh, space for both uh, creating the incentives and I think uh, this 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 these unilateral EU measures in a way aim to do that, right? To sort of create the incentives or to create the unilaterally some incentives for other countries to, to change their behavior. But I I also think that it's difficult for this to take, I mean, this alone will not solve the issue, right? Because it, what it may happen is that simply uh, Mercosur countries uh, will just decide that they would rather uh, trade with China or India, which is a possibility and has been threatened, especially by the president of Paraguay, who's taking the presidency of, of, of Mercosur next next semester. So what I, I think the, the, the main challenge for us uh, will be to get a combination of, on the one hand, uh, the the let's say the the status quo I think we all agree here in this certainly in this room uh, needs to change but how do you get it to change uh, in a way that developed country the developing countries uh, are, are 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 happy with uh, in the sense that they will not 
uh, they they can renounce their their what they see as tools for development. And again, the president of Brazil has been uh, quite clear on that. Uh, in 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 the in on in on in the in the name of uh, ensuring uh, climate change, and that uh, I think is the Gordian knot of of global sustainability. Because uh, I think in the EU, especially uh, what the way I see uh, EU uh, centric, uh, let's say uh, thinkers speaking, it seems to be le more about let's say removing the responsibility of the EU into that. Well, said well, the EU is no longer going to consume. Okay, that's I mean, that's that's one thing. And if that's what you're you're maximizing uh, for, let's say, let's say your own responsibility in this, that could be a possibility. So you just don't trade anymore. But how do you do then if Brazil and China and India and Australia uh, are then themsel themselves uh, increasing their emissions? And I think that in that sense, uh, what we need is some sort of agreement. Probably it's going to happen bilaterally rather than multilaterally, at least at first. And, and we need this sort of agreement to, to come out and very soon. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geraldo, for uh, an excellent uh, intervention, as always. Uh, uh, we'll now hand it over to uh, Jennifer Morricone. Jennifer, please. Mm, good, good afternoon. Um, I'm representing an organization that's called OIT, which is the Organization of Women in International Trade. So I'll really take it down to the grassroots level. And I would like to rebound back on the fact that um, climate-related policies or trade agreements are actually observed as an opportunity from our side, not as a barrier to development. Um, they may change the balance, and we've noticed that or observed that at least women-led companies are taking this as an opportunity um, to tackle, or at least, let's say, the climate-related issues are an opportunity for them to build up companies, and they have an ability to see beyond the return on investment often, uh, or the only monetary, let's say, the um, they take a more of a, um, a broader specter to their companies and include sustainable factors uh, in their business development. So we observe that it speaks a bit more their language and it corresponds to their values and uh, for a long-term vision. Um, we would actually like to see more sustainable criteria um, and we observe that it will benefit women entrepreneurs and women as consumers because of the um, indirect consequences of uh, free trade agreements that can have of women and consumers, but I won't go in more into depth with that. So we would like also to see uh, more climate related um, restrictions or let's say restrictions is negative, but uh, criteria is also into uh, the financial um, mechanisms in between countries. And we think Europe is pushing well forwards, but um, and being a driver. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we see not only the climate uh, should be taken into consideration, but also especially the biodiversity, because the climate can still be resolved, but the biodiversity that will be damaged will not come back or we will not recuperate it. So this is a bit our vision on it. Um, I don't know if um, we'll, with the questions and answers, we'll be able to go more into depth on that topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. And our next speaker is Professor Ilaria Espa. Uh, she's an associate professor at uh, the, the University of Sierra in Lugano. And uh, she's also a lead counsel for uh, the Center for International Sustainable Development Law, CISDL. Uh, Ilaria, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you to the organizer of this wonderful Climate Law and Governance uh, Day. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, and since I come sort of at the end of this first round of interventions, let me just probably seize this opportunity to just um, identify a little bit uh, what are the fil rouge that I could see from all of the different contributions from the wonderful experts of this panel. The first point I think um, more or less every one of us uh, touched upon is that at the very end of the day, countries are really 
try to accelerate on their climate action, but at the same time using very widely divergent national strategies and measures to address climate change, right? And ultimately, apart from the divergence um, of these strategies, we can ultimately see that there is a very much of a proliferation of trade-based policy instruments that are based also called production and processes methods, PPM-based measures, which we know have been a very, very controversial type of measures within the traditional uh, trade, uh, trade um, regime. And this can be new, innovative ways to look at traditional tariff instruments. For instance, with a number of us mentioned, for instance, the, the, the liberalization of environmental goods. But we also see PPM-based measures uh, that are unilateral, in essence, such, such as the CBAM, which are extremely complex in their implementation. Um, and here I wanted to highlight a little bit of a paradox that to a large extent the complexity of measures such as unilateral trade-based climate measures um, such as the CBAM are very much complex because they seek to ensure to the largest extent possible WTO compatibility. <laughs> so to me this is a bit of a paradox because if you really look through this very complex regulation of the EU CBAM, and I could also uh, make this intervention for the deforestation free regulation, etc. you see that there is a very, very hard um, effort on the part of the EU to try and present this measure, not just as the carbon leakage motivated measures, this is evidently for environmental justification purposes, but also as trying to present the measure as a fair measure, a measure that would have a chance to be also flying from a non-discrimination perspective. And here, I think um, that uh, the, 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 the key point of, if we look at the very, you know, wider trend of measures that uh, are there, uh, that uh, countries are trying to implement to accelerate on the climate change front, uh, the main point to retain, I think, is that we do not just need for countries to use their strategies, but also we need to work through international cooperation, a way to ensure for some degree of equivalence across these divergent policies and strategies. Because I think that to the extent that countries are going to go their own way because they want to be ambitious, because they want to show the world that they are virtuous, etc., we are going to have inevitably a lot of tensions and potential challenges within the WTO which at the very end of the day are not good for any for, for anybody, right? So I think we could really try and accelerate on the climate policy interoperability front. And I think this is where PTA's negotiations could have a potential for paving the way towards more multilaterally relevant work. And I think the WTO certainly might have a role to play here as well. Thank you so much. And I very much look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much. And I think we can all agree that cooperation is much better than confrontation. Thank you, Ilaria. Our uh, last but not least speaker is uh, Ricardo Melendez Ortiz. Uh, I owe a lot of personal thanks to uh, Ricardo for many years and giving me an opportunity to write about uh, trade and sustainable development. Um, Ricardo is also famous because uh, he helped negotiate uh, the part of Agenda 21 that talks about trade and environment. And if you've never looked at Agenda 21 and it, you're interested in uh, trade and sustainable development, please reread that chapter from 1992 because several of the proposals made in Agenda 21 are still not implemented. Ricardo. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much, um, Marcus. And again, uh, uh, I should congratulate you and your colleagues for this uh, uh, new version of uh, of this symposium, which is really of absolute top quality. Very hard to add what has been said, but and I know we have very little time, so let, let me try to just sort of give some uh, uh, sort of sort of points, uh, very quick uh, telegraphic points on, on some thoughts. 
Um, the first one is that, yes, of course, we're going through a very uh, special moment. I think Fabiano said it's, it's momentous right now uh, on the trade climate change uh, uh, relationship. Also, picking up from what was said in the panel, is not really about um, uh, ensuring that trade is seen as contributed to, to contributing to climate. Now, you hear too much of this in these halls, uh, particularly this week. Uh, is really about what someone else said here, is about embedding climate objectives into trade policy. And those are two different things. Now, uh, believe me, the trade doesn't need to be defended. I mean, the, the, here you, you go around the, the halls and you hear a lot of, of uh, noise coming out uh, as if we're here to promote climate, uh, promote trade, sorry, and then uh, try to persuade developing countries that uh, because there would be new opportunities in this uh, uh, climate change uh, world, uh, they should also embrace then climate change. And I, I don't think this is this is the way to go. That's, that's a very, I think it's a very important point to make. It's about embedding climate objectives in trade policy. Then you use the proper instruments. And on that, you need clarity of purpose as you design the instruments. And you need to, to design instruments that particularly, or if they are of a unilateral, even bilateral, or in plurilateral, the new generation of plurilateral agreements, that are really fit for purpose in a very tight manner. So they have to really resist any assessment on their, uh, again, the accomplishment of those objectives. Are they really there to add to the mitigation, or if it's the case that adaptation or remediation loss of damage, in climate change. If not, we shouldn't even entertain it, which just, and, and we have good law uh, from the WTO and the, 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 the regime complex on, on trade law uh, that can take care of this guy's protectionism, for instance, for instance, and other motivations that may be behind those instruments. Now, uh, I think it was Richard just now that mentioned, for instance, on CBAM, which is probably the, the, the latest manifestation that we have the use of, um, of these instruments that is raising everybody's concerns. Um, so we are contributing to the EU's target uh, on emission reduction. And I think until we don't make these kind of measures, and I mean the border carbon adjustments uh, type of measures, um, measures that contribute in a, in a more uh, equal, uh, equalitarian, uh, egalitarian and also uh, comprehensive manner to the global targets, uh, which probably are not having yet the right instruments in place. I'm happy actually that CIMM was, uh, was enacted. I'm actually impressed by the process that the EU uh, followed in designing the, the instrument and in the process that it is following in its implementation. We'll see what we get. Um, but they have taken care of consultation. It's still very far on the question of addressing the, the problem of capabilities, uh, which, uh, and, and, and the, the issue of introducing uh, differentiation uh, probably in the implementation of the instrument. And that will need to be done. So again, because of lack of time, let me just jump to this other um, sort of elephant in the room that we need to address. And it's the question of um, how size of markets and particularly uh, energy matrices really now uh, redefine or should the way in which we deal with the various actors and international trade. So if you think about, for instance, there, was, uh, there were a few interventions on Brazil that Geraldo mentioned uh, some of this. Um, you can't really compare implementation of CBAM uh, to Brazil to say Indonesia or uh, India or China. And I'm just being very, very frank here, right? Uh, so, so in the case of Brazil, there is an, uh, a research piece that came just a, weeks ago, a few weeks ago from FFL and some uh, Brazilian researchers, very, very rigorous piece that shows that there is a net benefit to the implementation of CBAM to Brazil because simply uh, the emission intensive industries in Brazil will actually have uh, advantages over other competing um, industries in other, in other locations. Uh, and so that's, that's one part of it. The other part of it is, what do we do with the LDCs? And then, so there's a lot of talk here, and particularly again in these corridors in UNFCCC, about these this questions of, um, of, of, of course, of, of uh, how do we really reach some level of equity there? And how do we differentiate uh, 
uh, if they also may or not contribute to, this, to, to global emissions. And I think that that requires a different type of response, but it probably requires, again, a differentiation in implementation. And so on differentiation, a, a quick word, because it, it has to do with, and I have so much more that I want to say, but a quick word that has to do with the design, design of trade law. So we, had, we have now 60, 70 years of um, MFN, national treatment, and, and the non-discrimination type of clauses that really um, are above anything that we do on international trade. But, but we crossed that, well, there are two things. One is that, as you know, as, as good lawyers too, uh, we, when you design those agreements, uh, you make sure that you include all sorts of uh, ways around those principles, but also all sorts of exclusions. And so, also, so that's, there should not be feared about differentiation when differentiation is justified. That's my, my point. But the, the second thing is that we've crossed sort of the, the highest uh, sort of uh, the, the threshold, if you like, on non-discrimination a few years ago uh, with the steel tariffs and other type of, of, of measures that have been taken in the past six years. And so we are behind, I, I think, beyond that sort of discussion. And we should probably use, um, actually, I'm going to paraphrase John Kerry and say we really need to embrace the urgency in the climate crisis and use uh, the, the need for urgent action to revisit those kind of principles when it comes to uh, to climate uh, change, but also to the biodiversity loss, as it was also mentioned in the, in the panel before. So I think we shouldn't fear that. And, but doing that should not take away from the obligation, the responsibility, the moral responsibility and so on that we have to be um, then again, equitable in the way that it is done and make sure that we take care of, the, of those that are less advantaged. That all the time. So let me maybe do it there. That gives us uh, about 15 minutes for uh, a conversation here in the room, because, and with those who are online, I'm looking to the uh, online uh, moderators. If there are any questions, please ask them in the Q&A uh, button. We have uh, heard from the panelists. We had a, a significant, um, array of voices um, on the trade and climate change uh, interlinkages. Uh, we talked about the Lieferketten Gesetz, uh, the supply chain legislation from uh, Germany. And so let's open up the floor and hear from the audience. Can we have your questions? Professor Van Asen. Thanks, Marcus, and thanks everyone for this excellent panel. Hello, Van Asselt, University of Cambridge. Please yourself. Yes, there you go. Um, so my question is uh, for you, uh, Emilio, in particular, but if anyone wants to jump in, I would also be curious. Um, you mentioned uh, working groups on their bilateral trade agreements and developing standards through that manner as one way to counter some of the issues that occur with the deforestation regulation with CBAM. Um, and I'm wondering, particularly in regard to CBAM, well, how does that then work if other countries also start to adopt their own border carbon adjustment? What if the UK follows the EU? What if Canada follows? What if Australia follows? Um, so would the Mercosur region then need to start developing standards in all these different working groups? Or do we need to change forum? And if so, and this is for me the million dollar question, which forum would be appropriate for that? Yes. Thank you for the question. I think uh, there are a number of fora that this discussion has to be pursued uh, bilaterally between EU and exporters countries like Brazil, but also multilateral uh, agreements. And uh, we've seen uh, in this case, like CBAN and the EU directive on deforestation that the, there are provisions, for instance, in the EU directive for deforestation for uh, a premium on low carbon products. <clears throat> and uh, so, but on the other hand, there are no 
concrete measures announced for this. So it's not uh, um, maybe the best way to, to increase trust if you show the stick and you talk vaguely about possible uh, carrots in the future. So I think, uh, uh, as very well mentioned, where are the tools to scale up good practices? Where is the climate finance? Because paraphrasing Lord Keynes, in the long term, we will all be net zero. The problem is, is the hurdles and, and the costs of the transition. So we need finance, for instance, still. In the long term, yes, it will be good to, for Brazilian competitiveness to have a, a, an agreement on, on, on uh, say, uh, levying the carbon footprint. But uh, in the short term, you need uh, huge, massive uh, investments uh, to change from coal, from coal to natural gas for direct reduction and then go into green hydrogen from natural gas. So I think this uh, sort of uh, new for, for instance, jet peace, just energy transition partnerships, uh, things of the sort, climate clubs of the north with selected countries. So you come to the, the table and you have a needs oriented addressing sustainable development goals, addressing the needs of the, the developing countries as well, and both working together towards uh, a cost effective uh, ways of achieving the climate goals. Thank you very much. Uh, Tejas, do we have any questions online? No questions online. If I might just like, if I may jump in and add something, uh, excellent question. I would say uh, that's likely, I think, that other countries will follow suit in uh, enacting this type of regulation. We've been discussing this afternoon. And I think this sort of lead, leads us to perhaps the most fundamental underlying question of today's debate, which is how do we explore synergies uh, between uh, the trade regime and the climate, uh, the climate change, uh, change regime, so as to avoid um, climate trade wars, uh, disguise protectionism, uh, the creation of climate clubs that Professor uh, Lahovere just mentioned, and uh, how do we avoid adverse effects not only on trade, but also on the climate regime itself, as uh, we know there's a, there's a concrete possibility of, uh, of trade regulations aggregating teeth, if you will, to uh, the climate change regime. But uh, there's a fine balance in implementing this because we all remember what happened uh, to Kyoto. So there's this uh, very carefully uh, diplomatic language uh, that was very carefully considered for the Paris Agreement to have uh, to, 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 to have uh, the, to, 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 to reach uh, universal or almost universal acceptance. So I think whenever we think of moving forward with uh, uh, climate and trade regulations, with, we must also uh, think of ways to advance the objectives of both regimes without breaking this delicate balance. Thank you very, very much, Alessandra. I'm, I'm just getting a note from the organizers that unfortunately we have uh, slightly less time than uh, we thought. And we, if there's one quick question, we can still take it, but otherwise, yes, go ahead. Um, but then we have to sort of finish uh, the panel. I will be quick. I was hesitating whether to say something or not, but I will anyway. When we talk about the investment and then in transition, and then about trust as well, I just want to share an example where um, a company, by the way, the one I work for, IFF, has invested uh, a lot since 2009 to develop an alternative for plastics, right? And is a polymerization that happened in industrial environment. And because of that, is not really, is considered plastic still. This uh, has been uh, following the EU uh, single use of plastic directive is also now being transported into, if not mistaken, the sustainable design. 
and as private sector, once again, uh, the company, we feel really like uh, disappointed. Once again, there's like millions of investment trying to find a solution. But then at the end of the day, the solution is treated in the same way as this is not sustainable. I mean, it's not. So I just want to express that in point uh, that has been made to the investments and find the solution and the trust. And I think this is unfortunately not a good one <laughs> uh, that at least we experience. And not only the company that I work for, but other also peers uh, in the industry. I'll stop here. I could give more examples that really is happening in the ground in the field, but I just wanted to add this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and of course, I, I think one of the take home messages of this panel has to be that we need to emphasize collaboration over autonomous measures, unilateral uh, measures. On the other hand, um, the direction of travel is very clear. The Paris Agreement has very clear long term objectives that all countries have committed to achieve, right? We also need to discuss the uh, trade policy in that context. I'm getting really strong indications from uh, Professor Marie Claire, who wrote a book on Athena's treaties. If you want to, and she's not saying anything about it, but if you want to know more about this subject, uh, please also reference the book, reference all the fantastic speakers that uh, we've had. Their work has been inspirational over the years. I thank you all for joining our trade panel today and especially my amazing co-chair and you know, dare I say all the uh, wonderful Brazilian researchers that uh, we had, uh, we have heard of from today because I think we need to talk more with each other rather than each other. Uh, Alessandra, you have the final. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again for uh, uh, to our uh, fantastic panelists. I'm going to keep this very, very brief. We're pressed for time and I should be at the rear room to, as a speaker in the next panel. So uh, I would like to again uh, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank Marcus, my uh, fantastic co-chair. I wanted to thank again the CISDL and the Climate Law and Governance Initiative for this wonderful uh, initiative. And uh, just as a final parting word uh, and perhaps some food for thought, I personally think it was very interesting to have such a diverse panel in terms of expertise. Uh, because in the real world, uh, lawyers do often uh, work with professionals from other areas, uh, fields of knowledge. And today we had discussions on international relations, on politics, on economics, on uh, technical and scientific aspects. And I think this was very, very enriching and enlightening. Thank you very much. <laughs>